We are at Schloss Leopoldsgrund, the home of the Salzburg Global Seminar. If you look across the lake from the Schloss, there is a large mountain, the Untersberg, and my guest will soon be banished, stranded at the top of this mountain for a very long time, indefinitely. My guest is taking part in the annual American Studies program of the seminar, and the theme this year is Great American Literature. So, Anna Manzana Scalvo, you are an associate professor of American Literature at a university in Spain. Mm -hmm. And what got you interested in American culture, American literature? I guess you can call it a family affair. Because um, two of my uncles, uh, these are stories I heard, migrated from their tiny, tiny, tiny little town in Salamanca, in very rural Salamanca, and somehow made it to New Jersey, to Elizabeth, New Jersey. So I grew up with all these stories, and um, I guess they just uh, left some kind of imprint on me. You've also written on ethnic American literature. What do you consider to be ethnic as opposed to any other kind of American literature? Well, that's a very interesting question because uh, I guess everything is ethnic. There is a beautiful joke, I think, taken from uh, The New Yorker in which um, uh, some white people um, are having uh, dinner in a very posh restaurant and they kind of look at one another and, and wonder, are we ethnic? Oh, they probably are. So that's, you know, ethnicity um, or the quality of uh, ethnic, it's just really a label because, you know, what may seem ethnic for some people may seem totally natural or, you know, standard for others. So that's a really contested uh, adjective. But when you write about ethnic American literature, give me an example of somebody that you've written about who is an ethnic American writer. <laughs> I've written about Toni Morrison, I write about um, Latino writers, I write about Caribbean writers, um, Native American writers. Um, are they ethnic? Not for themselves. For them, they're just for themselves, or according to their own parameters, they're just a perfectly normal people, run of the mill. So you haven't included the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? actually include the white Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon Protestant in dialogue with mm. uh, so-called ethnic writers so, mm. as, uh, so as not to catch-a-wise or isolate uh, so-called minority writers from the national discourse of what literature, what the nation is. Um, because I think that dialogue needs to be held if we want to have a kind of accurate picture of what uh, literature in the U.S. is like. Now, on your mountain retreat, on the Altersburg, <laughs> where you will be very much alone with just three books, three works of American literature, what is your first book? My first book is uh, City of Glass uh, by Paul Auster. And why have you chosen that? Um, it's hard to explain this affinity you develop with some, um, some works. You don't even need to write professionally about them. Uh, but from City of Class, I just uh, loved the descriptions of the city and the description of places in the city. The report about the way the different inhabitants occupied cityscape. And um, I also love the way um, Oster creates an urban palimpsest, palimpsest of um, uh, trajectories and spatial practices and comings and goings, and how cre he creates a language out of that. Could we hear a little of his language? Yes, yes. This is actually, um, um, it's going to be slightly long, but I hope it's worth it. Um, here, um, uh, the private eye, who is the narrator of the story, is talking about the work of the man he is supposed to shadow. And he's, um, he's deranged, and um, he's talking about two places that are going to overlay the cityscape of New York. 
Uh, so he's talking about uh, the Tower of Babel and Paradise as places kind of coalescing in, um, in, the, in New York. Just as Babel had been built 340 years after the flood, so it would be dark predicted. And dark is a character he makes up. Exactly 340 years after the arrival of May Mayflower of Plymouth, that the commandment to build another Babel would be carried out. 340 years, according to Dark's calculations, meant that in 1960, the first part of the settlers' work would have been done. At that point, the foundations would have been laid for the real work that was to follow, the building of the new Babel. Already, Dark wrote, he saw encouraging signs in the city of Boston, for there, as nowhere else in the world, the chief construction material was brick, which was which as set forth in verse 3 of Genesis uh, 11, was specified as a construction material of Babel. In the year 1960, he stated confidently, the new Babel would begin to go up, its very shape aspiring towards the heavens, a symbol of the resurrection of the human spirit. History would be written in reverse. What had fallen would be raised up. What had been broken would be made whole. Once completed, the tower would be large enough to hold every inhabitant of the new world. There would be a room for each person, and once he entered that room, he would forget everything he knew. After 40 years and 40 nights, he would emerge a new man, speaking God's language, prepared to inhabit the second everlasting paradise. So. We go from New York City to your second book, which is? Which is um, Beloved by Toni Morrison. And, and it's totally, a totally completely, you know, completely different book altogether. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess that um, my attraction to uh, Oster's uh, novella is um, how he conceives and presents this beautiful textualized city. And what I think Morrison does is uh, not to portray a textualized city, but a textual body. So in, in Morrison, I love the way she kind of goes back to the primordial uh, text, which is our body, our personal manuscript. And I guess that's uh, what kind of... Um, I first or uh, first uh, drew me to Morrison's writing, mm -hmm. apart from uh, its utterly poetic quality. Do you want to give us a little taste of that? Um, absolutely, um, the readings. So um, what I love about um, the issue of the body as text in the novel is that um, there is not a text on her body. It's just a, uh, it's just a revolting uh, clump of, st of scars that uh, she actually got after a brutal beating from you know, one of the masters or overseers of the plantation where the main character, uh, Seth, lives. And um, so what she's doing in this uh, quote is to go beyond the beating itself, to look at herself as a reader. So, so that um, the scars are still scars, and yet, you know, at the same time, they become something else. So here's the first quote. Uh, she's telling um, this man, who was also a former slave at uh, the plantation, what happened to her. So it's really a story of uh, her life. It's a sort of uh, kind of a, um, a very small piece of biography she's giving. After I left you, those boys came there and took my milk, held me down and took it. I told Mrs. Garner of them. She had that lump and couldn't speak, but her eyes rolled out tears. Them boys found out I told them. School teacher made, made one open up my back, and when it closed, it made a tree. It, got, it grows still there. So we go from this car in the back to a tree. A tree. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a total metamorphosis mm -hmm. of um, the effects of violence on a body and how I love the way Morrison transforms that into an image of life that expands and changes with time. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a, another quote about that. Uh, because in the, nest, in the next scene, this former slave um, actually caresses those, um, those scars um, in such a way that um, the scars reveal her, bo her body and her story. So they really become a text to listen to. And uh, this is a beautiful quote, I think. He, Paul D, that's his name, held her breasts in the palms of his hands. He rubbed his cheek on her back and learned that way her sorrow, the roots of it, its wide trunk and intricate branches. So that's the way, you know, the same body, you know, with the revolting scars gets to be caressed and um, read and reinterpreted. So it's a you know, total transformation of that uh, act of violence that becomes an act of life. Mm -hmm. And it's all kind of embedded into the narration. And your third book? My third uh, choice um, is a contemporary uh, Dominican-American writer, Junot Diaz. And uh, he, has, um, he has a novel out that is, um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's been a big su success. I think he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. But in this uh, first uh, collection of stories, he's a completely different writer. He's very terse and he never says an extra word. You know, it's very, very, um, um, minimal in his writing. Uh, at the same time, he's able to convey a lot of uh, violence in the writing. So, um, the part I would like to, uh, the story I would like to read from is called um, Aurora. And uh, the reason I chose it is because uh, for me, what he's doing is just taming old myths, you know, mm -hmm. the goddess of Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, and see how they work in contemporary, um, what I called, in different geographies, like the geography of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. So um, this is um, what I think is a very interesting quote from the story. Uh, which is uh, very revealing as to the nature of love in the ghetto and uh, the nature of place and the role of a goddess uh, transformed into a um, drug addict. So all those transformations and relocations are taking place in this very uh, short story. She, Aurora, meets me at the door of the utility room, a single bulb lit behind her. I shut the door behind us and we kiss, once, on the lips, but she keeps them closed, first date light, first, first date style. A few months ago, Cut broke the lock to this place, and now the utility's room's ours. Like an extension, an office, concrete with splotches of oil, a drain hole in the corner where we throw our zigs and condoms. It's very minimal and mm. very <laughs> violent and very condensed. Yes. It condenses this uh, atmosphere of indifferent places because there is no bed, there is no apartment, there is just a utility room. So I love the way uh, Junot Diaz strips things bare. You know, strips space bear and strips a goddess bear. And he can get away with it in a very concrete and cool manner. And thank you so much for joining us on the Autosperk. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs>